and they'll have to go back through it and change it. Right. I mean, we did a, we were down in San Salvador fishing this and that, and I, I'm taking out the girl that's doing the editing and putting it on TV, and she says one night, and we're at dinner. She says, "What are those fish you're catching with those long noses on them?" <laughs> <laughs> For real, those are the sailfish. It was a sailfish. Uh, she edited it to the point a few times to where we uh, fighting a fish on a pin for a. He went to the wire line, and then he's on the electric reel. <laughs> and that was called editing. <laughs> right. Well, we don't edit. Um, as a matter of fact, I already started the recording, so that little bit just was on there. I want to welcome everybody to the Real Guy podcast today. Um, this is by far the biggest day ever um, for me in the podcast because I'm down here visiting somebody very special to my heart. Um, Tom Green, um, anybody that's been around sport fishing in the last six or seven decades for crying out loud knows tom green has got advice from tom green and people talk about influ influencers in the industry this is the original influence in the industry um it's custom rod and reels down here in uh pompano and uh tom thanks for uh thanks for uh Give me some time today. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity yeah. to be able to tell some tell some more lies, more stories, and fill in a few blanks. Lies and stories, um, you know, that's huge in the fishing world. Um, but before we get too far, because a lot of people um, hear the beginning of the podcast, and these podcasts kind of get long, um, don't hear the end of the podcast. So I wanted to tell them about your book. Um, the book is called A Net. Of full tales. Net full of tales. Net full of tales. I'm sorry. And what happened? Let me tell you how it started, okay? Yeah, I want to hear. All my life, fishermen in general, is I tell stories about A, B, C, D, E. We were up in Flagler. We were doing this and that. And people kept saying, did you ever write that down? I said, well, not really. My little sister is a professor at Lynn University and very smart and that type of deal. She says, why don't you write it down and we'll edit it and put it in a book. I said, that sounds good, but I don't have enough time. She says, if you write it, we'll get it published. Right. So I wrote down about four stories on a tape recorder, gave it to a young lady at FAU, paid her $25 an hour to type it up, and she had me catching snook on the Gulf Stream trolling Ballyhoo, <laughs> and they were jumping under the weed line. <laughs> I mean, that's how that's how far and crazy. So after spending $500 with her, I said, this will never work. <laughs> so then I brought in, there's a name that we all know down here in South Florida, a guy by the name of Steve Waters. Right, right. And Steve offered suggestions, and he helped a little bit. And what, Steve helped sculpt the whole thing for no, you? He, no, he didn't do it that way because he was too busy. Right. Then I went out, and I found Steve Kantner. Right. And everyone knows Steve Kantner. If you can get him off the phone when you talk to him, you're okay. But once you start talking, he's worse than me. He doesn't shut up. Dude, Steve's And a, I love Steve. Oh, he's a character. And he's a very good fisherman. So what I would do is I would – and I didn't write down much. Or I don't believe in notes, and I don't believe in an outline. I just start talking. Right. So Steve would come in the office like this and do what we're doing right now, and he'd start with notes and a tape recorder. And I'd tell him what happened, where we were, how we did it. And he'd go home and type it out. Two days later, he'd send it to me on the computer. i read it. No, it wasn't like that, Steve. It was like this. And we'd redo it. And we wrote every story and rewrote it about three, four, or five times. The biggest problem I had when he wanted to change it to his words, not my words. <laughs> and the way I talk and the, what I say is Tom Green's version, not Steve Cantor. Right. And Steve did a good job. I paid him very dear, good money to do this job. And he was very appreciative, very happy. Okay. So since I wrote the book, I've had probably four or five customers come to me. How did you do the book? What did you do? And they've all written their own books. <laughs> well, what did you expect? Oh, I love, no, it doesn't bother me <laughs> in the least. All I did was made, it, made them aware. We all say, I wish I could write a book. Everybody can write a book. If you got the information, if you can remember it, Without looking it up, you have no problem writing a book. So now in your uh, social sh circles, um, you can introduce yourself as Tom Green, the esteemed author. 
definitely do so. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Well, I've, you know, this, I'm on my third or fourth publication right now. Right. And I self published it. Just you find a company that does it. It's it's not that much money. You know, I sell it for nineteen and twenty nine ninety five. I assure you, I don't make any money. Right. I give away more than I sell. Right. And I have people from all over the world. The greatest thing, and there's several stories that people really want to know what happened. I tell the story, well, they don't believe it. And then I tell another one, they don't believe it. And it goes right on down the line. And I've actually had people come in this story. I don't want to tell the story now, but come in this story, in the store, and say, hey, there's no way you did it that way. Well, a crazy one would be a simple one. Go to fish in the keys, the bridges with George Copeland or whoever. Right. Three or four go down. We used to leave the tackle store here at night at 5 30, quarter to six. Jump in the car, two or three guys with a, a couple of big rods, um, an ice chest with some water, ice. We didn't drink beer because right. we were fishing. I never drank. First drink of my life, I was 23, so was nothing <laughs> to do with beer drinking. I think I gave up drinking one time at 23. <laughs> yeah, well, I never, had, honestly, didn't have a first. So we drive all the way to the Keys, fish Channel 2, Channel um, 5, and Long Key. And it was based on the tides, which bridge would be on. Right. We'll get there, walk out on the bridge. After dark, start of the outgoing tide, you'd be quiet and you'd listen. You hear me? And you hear the tarpon blowing up. There but another half mile out, so we get out there and you look down, they're blowing up. You hear out front, they're blowing up. So we take these 10, 11 foot surf rods with back then 40, 50, 60, up to 80 pound Andy line, right. 80 or 100 pound leader. And these big 12, 14 inch pikeys over here on the wall, cast them upstream, and you wind back at an angle back toward the bridge. And I tell all these new people that are with me, they've never done it. So you just wind, wind, and all of a sudden your reel is going to stop and you can't turn the handle. <laughs> I said, all you do is bend into the fish and you set to hook as hard as you can and you wind. If he's a 40, 50, 60, 70 pounder, he's going to be up on the surface jumping instantly. Right. If he's 80, 90, or 100, he might pull a little drag. If he's 120, 25, 50, 200, he's going to pull a lot of drag. He might not jump for two minutes. Right. You fight him as long as you can. You get him inside the, the bridge, you let him shake off. Luckily, if he does. And it's not uncommon to hook a fish. You fight him for 20 minutes. Thank God he jumps off. It took two-thirds of your spool out. <laughs> you turn the handle twice, and you're hooked up again. Right. That's what we did all the time. Many nights we jump 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 fish right. in three or four casts. I mean, just six. Crazy numbers, crazy numbers. Beyond comprehension. So I want you to tell me a story. Because um, we have this, you know, social media presence, and we call it the Real Guy Network, and it's people that are really into fishing, good fishermen, and we have thousands and thousands of them. And um, we have this philosophy called Real Guys Helping Real Guys. And you're the epitome of Real Guys Helping Real Guys because you made it your life teaching people the correct way to fish, giving them tips, helping them along. And when my dad moved here um, in the late 70s, um, yeah, he fished. I mean, you know, he caught some bluefin, but he was green. I mean, he didn't know diddly. And then I'm just a kid. I'm like 10 years old, even younger. And then I can remember him hanging out with you. Right. And then I remember his marlin career and his marlin fishing abilities and the things that we did right. in those days. Back with Joe Munson, the salt chicken days. Well, I want to talk about that stuff, right. but... You know, people, um, you know, ask me, they say, Jeff, you know, how you know, how did you get, you know, so entwined in fishing? How did you get that good at it? And I, ex I try to explain a little bit, but I really can't explain because the unfair advantage that I've had over the years was because of real guys helping real guys. But it started when we moved here and you helping my father learn the billfish game. Right. And um, if you could kind of just tell me how you met my old man and then... Um, remember, I was so young, Tommy. I can, don't barely know. Remember, I, totally. I can barely remember this stuff. But, you know, we went to Venezuela, and we caught billfish, and we, uh, we were learning from the best we, anglers we in the were, world. We were the first 
people in Venezuela, the first, and the reason that happened is your father was working for Chris Craft, selling the 45-foot Chris Crafts. Right. And they had people down there that had a lot of money back in those days. And the one guy owned a, let's say, one of the big beverage companies. I can't remember the name of the boat. And he wanted to go faster. So they literally pulled the floorboards out of the boat, the couch, everything else out of the boat. So he could be offshore a half hour later, earlier than everybody else. He bought a boat, the identical boat for his family to do 22, 24 knots. But he emptied the boat, so it'd do 34 knots. <laughs> I mean, that's how crazy it was. No, it was crazy. That was the that. very beginning, yes. But t t tell me, how'd you, how'd you meet my old man? He came in a tackle store because we, I started in Boca Raton on Palmetto Park Road, June the 6th of 1959. <laughs> okay. Last week, 10 days ago, was my 60th year here. Wow, phenomenal. Congratulations. So, I mean, I started young. I'm only 71 now. So I've got 60 years in this retail business every day of my life. And the smartest thing I have is I I want to learn from everybody. I want to learn from the Barky Garnsies of the world, the Skip Smiths of the world. I go back where I, when I started, nobody was too dumb or too smart for me to ask a question. Did you do better going up sea, down sea, cross sea? You know, what was your drag set at? Why did you do it that way? What color skirt did you use? Did you use natural belly? Did you use a debone mullet? Is he split tail? Is he wedged and debone? Tell me your opinions. What do you think about dredgers? You know, um, I think it was um, Pam Basco called me one day and said, we got a problem for uh, one of the big magazines. Marlin Magazines, I guess it was. We want to know the 50th, 50 biggest tips in sport fishing in the world. What's right. changed? And I said, sweetheart, that's a lot of changes. <laughs> yeah, but what do you think is the biggest? And that's 10 years ago. I said, well, you know, you got fluorocarbon leader materials. You got chemically sharpened hooks. You've got a crimp or a sleeve. We didn't have that years ago. We tied knots. Right. And it just goes on and on and on. We got line test machines, so you can test one against the other. We test knots in this store. You know, I'm, I tie a bimini twist today in 20-pound line in probably 15 or 20 seconds. Right. So we did all that type of stuff. I was in a, in a book yesterday, um, as we were talking before. Um, Mark Sosa wrote an article on me, and the name of the book was Tom Green's Upside Down Knot. An upside down knot is a knot that I used to tie onto the spool of a reel. So you can pull it tight, it doesn't unwind, it doesn't come loose. A prime example of what that knot did was, I got a boy by the name of, I call him 1289, um, Carl Alvick, who came in from California to Hawaii, big time fisherman, took a boat, a job on a big sport fish boat, and they had you know, four 130s, they went to Bermuda two years ago, and the boss would sketch a thousand pound blue like everybody else. <laughs> they get over there the first morning. They put the lines out. They catch right about three hundred right away. The boss says it's not a big deal. They catch another one, put a lure out again. He grabs one other lure because when he was in the store, he said, "Give me one lure that you recommend." So I had rigged a big headed lure, flat headed, whatever, right. with twelve a hook, four hundred pound leader. Fish came from underneath, piled on it, and this fish started dumping the Tiagra 130. They got a 18-year-old kid in the chair. He's hooked up. He's locked up. Safety line on the reel. This fish going straight away, greyhounded. He's coming back, backing through his own spread, full speed. He's got a couple of mates on board. One of the mates he happened to have, I believe it was Alan Card, from Bermuda, who's a world-class mate. And they said, come on back, come on back. Well, he's on a big Bertram, 65 Bertram. The cockpit is now full of water to the point where the coolers are floating overboard. Right. And they're still coming. <laughs> and he says, come on, come on. And just about that time, he looks up to the captain, says, we're out of line. He's still <laughs> coming. So he's got... You know, 1,200 yards of line out is 3,600 feet. It's a half a mile. The line stretched out. The rod stretched out. The rod's bent double. 
and he's going straight toward the fish. Thank God the fish is up. The belly and the line, he was able to keep up with the speed of the fish for five more minutes with a reel that has no line on it, and still greyhounding, still jumping, and they got on top of that fish. The knot did not untie, because the knot I tied is that good. You need to look it up and see what it is. Um, it's a hundred percent knot, and it held. All right. They got over top of the fish after an hour, and they spent the next four and a half or five hours, inch at a time, and they wound him up. <laughs> but here's and a punchline on that. Wait a minute. Okay. Before <laughs> the end of that, got to the end. They had a problem with the fighting chair. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Well, they had so much pressure on the rod, so much torque, he starts screaming that the chair is breaking. The gimbal is in the gimbal. The bolts that hold the gimbal in place started breaking out of the wood. They broke the fighting chair to the point where they had to take the chair off, unhook it from him, get it over to the covering board, Safety line on it, unhook the kid from it, and he's still backing down at 20 knots. <laughs> but it's literally tore the gimbal out of the fighting chair. You take a 130-pound rod with 70, 80 pounds of drag on it, you hang from the tip for 20 minutes, and it's bouncing and yanking. You just you tore the chair up. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's totally nuts. Totally nuts. Yep. But, you got, I mean, you got hundreds and hundreds of fish stories like that. The... um. So my dad was working at Rody Chris Craft. He knew these Venezuelan dudes because he was selling these sport fishes. To right, him. and then they'd come in and to see me. And then they'd come in here and try to figure out what to get to go get these fish. And I was building him rods Bil for these ones. Uh, a lot of what Chris Craft did in the very beginning, he, your, your dad would say to me, "Hey, I got a real good client. You got to treat him good. Fine, we'll sell you rod and reels. Okay." He says, no, "I got a guy that I want to give him rod and reels. Fine." So we. You know, we're building light tackle, 20-pound rods. At the same time, I was building all the rods for Kona, Hawaii, for Kelly and Joshua and Everett. Right. For you light know, tackle. Do you know? Just like these guys. Do you know I still use, to this day, if you look at my YouTube videos and my live videos with my clients, those white and green rods, spinning rods. Right. That we took to Venezuela then. We built those for Joe Munson. He had the first ever striker that was not red, white, and blue. It was green accent. And I use those rods to this day. Right. To this day, I use those rods. Those are great tarpon rods. Those are great tarpon rods. But we used those rods when we went to Venezuela um, way back then to catch, um, what we were trying to get white worm on, on 12 right. pound, I yeah, think it yeah. was. And that was on a, an old Kennedy Fisher, um, 696 rod blank, and a 5400 was a light one. Now explain, all right, do, do your best to explain to me from, all right, so my dad's bringing these Venezuelans in. They're buying gear from you. They're trying to f get their sport fishes perfect to go right. catch marlin. Now, from there, how the hell did we end up on the jet on the way to go to Venezuela to fish that big tournament that time? Because oh. remember, I'm only like 11 years old at the time, and I have a hard time, you all know, right. putting it all together. All right, the greatest deal of all is you had a few Venezuelans that came in here that were— you know, world famous guys. Jill right? Bellini. Yeah, Bellini and all those guys. Remember that? Jill awesome. Bellini, very well. Awesome. Well, what, what they invited me, I was the only American, I was speaking in Spanish, I was the only American on the Venezuelan team. They had three men teams fishing 12 pound line, and each guy went on a different boat each day. I built the rod, built the tackle, set them up. And they said, okay, fine. I had already won the Stuart Light Tackle Sailfish Tournament back in the 70s. So I had an idea what I was doing. <laughs> I had already caught sailfish on four pound, white marlin on four pound, blue marlin on eight. So I had already done all of that. I fished with Barky Garnsey. Barky Garnsey helped me as much as anybody in the world because he would sit down and talk to me in a language that I understood. Then I could turn around and give that language to my customers. Well, we get down to Venezuela and... We're going to, first morning is a lay day. And they said, we're going down to the boat, and then we'll be there in a little while. We'll show up in the morning. So we get to the boat called La Coco. Now, La Coco, that was the Chris Craft that my old man sold Bellini? Yeah, I believe so. I think, yeah, because I remember La Coco. And now this is the time we went together? Yes. Okay. Now, this is not, this is prior, probably one time before that even. Okay. Before the tournament. Okay. So we get down there to find fish. 
He had Munson, your old man, and myself, as who were on the jet to go down. So, um, I'm, you know, when you get somewhere, you want to go fishing in the morning. <laughs> right. Well, in the hotel room, I've got six rods, lines, leaders, bimini's, knots. Everything's rigged, ready. You go out of the hotel, walk down to the marina. And back then, this is prior to them shooting them in the parking lot, which we saw that a few times or <laughs> anything else. And today it's that dangerous. So I'm standing on the back end of the boat. I don't speak any English or any Spanish. I can't anybody to talk to me. You know, people on this boat, nobody's seen them. Oh, later. <laughs> so I wait. 637, 738, 9 9.30, 10 o'clock, finally shows up on the boat. I'm in the right boat. Oh, man, we have plenty of time. So, long story short, we load the boat, we talk. The mates come. They start rigging ballyhoo, rigging baits. We all jump on the boat. Well, finally, 1130 in the morning, we're going fishing. <laughs> I thought. <laughs> Thank you. So what did I get myself into? We go out of the cut. We turn left and go west. Run three or four miles. We go back inside. And we pull into the marina. Uh, do we need fuel? What are we in here for? Lunch. <laughs> so you leave the dock to go fishing to get lunch before you go fishing. Right. Okay. And we have to go four or five miles down the coast. So this is way of Venezuelan time. Right. <laughs> okay. So we pull in. Go upstairs, we sit and have lunch. These guys are talking and, you know, the whole bit. They're all talking about the tournament, which is the next day. Now, that tournament, that was like a world tournament or something? What, 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 like 70 or 80 international three-man team, Venezuelans mostly, from what I, Brazil and some other foreign countries. That was what, Ilta, right? And no, it, it wasn't Ilta no. to my knowledge. I can't, see, I, yeah, I can At I, that I, time, I don't think Ilta even existed at that time. So the Ilta came after that? Yes. Okay. So we sat there and we fished. We ate breakfast or lunch. It was lunch by that time. We finally get in the boat. We clear the cut at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> You're going on a tarpon trip. <laughs> and now we're driving, running 15 to 25 miles offshore to wherever the fish are. I don't know that either. My first day in Venezuela. Right. I've been at the boat since 6.30. I've been up since 4.30 in the morning, and I didn't sleep all night because I was so excited. All right, fine. We start running offshore. I see a pot of birds. I'm pointing at birds. They tell me, no, man, no worry. There's another pod. There's another pod. I had never seen what they say is a funnel cloud of birds. And that's what they were looking for? Yeah, and when you when you see that sight, you see 100, 1,000 birds, almost like a, a funnel cloud, like a tornado. Right. If you look at the base of the tornado, you get there, there's a pot of bait on the surface. On the top of the pot of the bait, you look in the water, and there's nothing but sailfish and white marlin cut through these pods. And there's 500 sailfish and 500 white marlin on every funnel. Now and I, there's 500 funnels at one time that you can see. Now think about this, Tom. Me being so young at the time and riding along on the boat and seeing this stuff, and then I would get back to Fort Lauderdale. And tell and, people, it, and nobody believed right, me. Right. You're look, all full of shit. I'm, looking, you know, I'm trying to tell the other kids yeah. about what we did no and way. what the heck was going on. And they're looking at me like, all right. You I know. come back telling the customers, yeah, you're full of hot air. Where you been? You smoking what? I said, I don't smoke, never have smoked. I don't drink. But I saw 500 funnels. There's no way. Dude, we were, the one thing I do remember is we were the only Americans there. I was, well, I was on the team. I was the only American in the entire Venezuelan tournament. I believe it was 210 anglers. Was it that big? Yeah, and like 70 teams. Um, I've got a trophy plaque. We won second or third place that year. Like uh, the first day, and we're fishing 12-pound line Right. on top of that. Right. And so you don't winch them to the boat. 
Right. You, they were allowed to back down and run off. That, yeah, that was the first time I've ever seen captains work that way. Yeah. Where the captains and the anglers were, I mean, what was it? If you had to fish on for more than like three minutes, the guy would reach over and cut the line or something well, they, like yeah, that? They gave you eight or ten minutes. Eight or ten the one, minutes. The ones they didn't like is ones that went down. Right. See, another thing about white marlin that we all learned the hard way, if you fight a white marlin hard and you keep him up, you can get to him pretty fast. Right. If you let him go down on him, you'll like fight him for an hour. You're not gonna play with that game. They don't play that game. All right. So what was going? What was happening is any times the whites would sound, they would just cut they the just line cut your and line be onto the break them off. Right. I remember that, and it was hard for me. It was, oh, yeah. it was hard for me to watch them do that. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, they just cut the line on that beautiful marlin. Yeah. But you know, like I said, I was so young and trying to put it all together, and it's kind of cool talking like this now because it's helping, you know, big time. Well, you know why I said. The greatest fishermen in the world back then were the Venezuelans. For sure. You know why? No. They had 70, 80 bites a day. They had more fish <laughs> bites and could see more fish than anybody else. You go to the Bahamas, the blue marlin fish, what do you see, four to six blues a, a season? You don't learn to drop back to them. No, if you get 70 bites at eight times 30, that's 2,100 bites that one season. You learn to get better. Yeah. The other thing that's taught me through the years, which is a very important statement, and I fish with some of the best in the world. I tell we fish uh, the Masters. I've fished about six times. I tell people to learn to break the line. What are you nuts? You got to learn to break, pull as hard as you can without breaking the line, but learn how hard you can pull until it until breaks. it breaks. Right. So I got down to the Masters the first year. And we fish in 20 pound tournament, Andy, that breaks that 18, 19 pound. You fish a dead boat, so you can't back up on him. All the captain's allowed to do is to keep the stern to the fish. And they said to me, How, What drag you got on? I said, What do you got? He said, Well, four, five, six. I said, I'm going to fish eight to 12. What are you doing that for? I'm going to pull on the fish. If I pull on him and can't move him, I'll back it off. But if he's greyhound and going away from me, I'll back it off. Right. But, you know, I fished there when I was fishing snook. I wanted to break the world record on snook. Right. One season, I caught 300 snook over 10 pounds on two-pound test. And I only broke a very few fish off, and they were in the rocks and the pile and the, I the bridges. I remember you building rods specifically to make that record. Right. And I came down here one day, and you took the time to show me the rod right. that you were building, and you said, this is specifically for this world record. But the rod was still designed for 8, 10, or 12-pound monofilament line, not for two-pound test. Right, right. you got to be able to pull on the fish. Right. People, people fish light line. And they still think you got to have a light, you know, light leader, light everything. A, a cute story there is there's a woman by the name of Pam Basco. Mm-hmm. Pam Basco is a very wealthy husband in Texas, big two story house. And she was fishing with Kelly and Jocelyn Everett in Kona, Hawaii. Okay. She set a lot of world records along with, with Kelly and Jocelyn. She wanted to catch a white marlin on two pound test. All right, that hadn't been done much. <laughs> so. Built of the rod, I told her what I was doing, showed her what I was doing, explained the reel, the whole bit. And back in that time, I believe we were fishing the Shimano 22 speed because the line doesn't have to come off a roller or go around the corner. You still use a baitcaster. The reels today that the Italica 12 or 16 would be the greatest reel in the world for right. light tackle fishing. Okay. And I helped design that with Shimano. But anyway, so we're sitting there. Um, Pam Basco, she said, well, how do I do this? She she devised it, and she came back and told me. Wintertime in Texas, how do you practice fishing? She would practice going up and down her stairs, padded, carpeted stairs, with a rod bent, with a snap swivel on it, with a one-pound or one-and-a-half-pound or eight-ounce or 12- or 16-pound lead, with the rod bent, walking up and down the stairs. So you got to wait on the end of the rod, and you're learning to bend and absorb the, the flex of that rod and of that lead without breaking the line. So she needed to know and be familiar exactly where that two-pound threshold exactly was. Exactly right. And she would just do that in order to get herself trained and comfortable. You got to bend. The rod's got to bend. 
You got to back off when you got to back off. It's no difference when you throw a fly to a tarpon and he comes up greyhound jumping. What is the first thing you do? You lean forward as far as you can and you point your rod at him. Right. Same principle. Right, right, right. And, and all of these, in 60 years of this, and, you know, I, t- I tell a story, I tell a joke, I tell a lie, I tell whatever. But I've caught fifteen to 20,000 snook. Let me, let me stop you right there because I did a recording the other day. And um, I don't know if you know this or not, but in today's day and age, they have what they call a 40-inch snook club. <laughs> and that's what I did. I, I kind of giggled. We my... never in our life measured a snook. <laughs> that is so funny because that is what I was talking about on the podcast. And I knew I was going to piss some people off. Right. But I says, well, somebody has to raise the bar. And I thought about coming to do a recording with you for a while now. And then after doing that podcast about the 40-inch snook club, I was like, the guy that taught me about big snooks was Tommy Green. And we didn't even talk about a snook. Never in my was, life. Unless it was 30 pounds. Right. That was like when you started talking about them. We had a 10-pound, 20-pound, 30-pound. What prime example of that. We can spend five minutes on this because it's fun. <laughs> Years ago, one season, we used to have a 30-pound snook tournament in this store. TNR, George, and I both. Everybody put up 50 bucks. At the end of the year, a 31, 32, 33, once in a while, 34, 5 pound snook would would win. 50 guys, and everybody's catching 30 pounders every day. I get up, come to the store at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning to, to weigh them on a certified scale, and I'd weigh 26, 27, 25, 29, 28. Might weigh 100 fish and never get a 30. Finally started to get a few 30s in May and June, a little later part of the year. And that was a joke, but everybody was catching 30 pounders every day. <laughs> I was on um, a 25-cent bridge with George Copeland one night, fishing up by the drawbridge. And I hadn't had a 30-pounder that year. I had 28, 28 and a half pound fish Right. in one season. I'd had... I had caught 187 fish up to that night over 10 pounds, but not a 30-pounder. And I had over 40 over 25. So we're standing on the bridge, flipped the mullet out. It goes deep. I sat to look at that fish, tore my butt up, <laughs> knees busted, ankles, you know, your hands. And it was a nice fish. Got him laid out on the surface. George got the bridge gaff. And back then we didn't have nets. And we gaffed him and got him up on the bridge. And it was a big fish. So it was 35 and a half pounds. Right. Nice fish. Well, that was fun. I reached over and had another mullet because I'd only been on there a few seconds. It was in the net. I flipped him right back out in the same place. It goes deep. I get thumped, laid over the bridge. I hooked a big fish. I hooked and pulled him for just a few seconds. And he didn't act right. All of a sudden, he comes to the surface. He's not fighting. He's not going right, not going left, not going up and down. I had brain hooked that fish. Brain hooked it? Yes, on the, <laughs> with the roof of the mouth, with a uh, 91, 74, 75, silver or brown, big old mustache hook, offset. And the hook went in his mouth, the top of the roof of his mouth. All right? <laughs> and laid him out, gaffed him. Put him on the bridge. When he landed on the bridge, the hook popped out of its mouth, and that fish went nuts. <laughs> so he was like, stunned. Like he's, yeah, like he was in shock or whatever. So, of course, we went in there to look and see where he was hooked and found out at the very top of the roof of his mouth, and a brain hooked is what some biologists and fish people <laughs> told me. But that fish was 33 and a half, and the other was 35 and a half. And, yeah, they're both over 40 inch. But the crazy point was two baits in a row, I catch Mass. two big fish. Right. The kid did uh, Jupiter Inlet 10, 12, 15 years ago. They caught the big daddy of them all, was standing on the North Chatty. Right. He's fishing with a rubber tro- um, swim bait. Right. A little five, six inch stuff with a, um, I think he had a pen 710 or 712, a red bone rod. In 12-pound line. And he looked in the water and could not believe his eyes. Because there were 30 or 40 snook laying on the north chatty, straight up and down, looking at him. He's looking at them. 
every fish was over 40 inches to 50 or 60. Right. So he sat there and swam that jig literally to the point where he put it in one of his mouth as he opened his mouth. <laughs> and he's trying to give him a bite it, set the hook. Fish went out around the jetty, went back into the inlet. And they screwed around there for about an hour. Finally, the guy in, a, in one of the flats boats there is a guide, saw what was going on. This kid has been fighting his fish all afternoon or all morning. Right. But the line is hung up on a rock in the middle of the inlet where the fish got it around. The kid don't want to break the line. So um, normally I could tell you the kid's name, but I don't remember his name. He <laughs> came in and picked up the kid off the jetty, barefoot, jumped on the bow of his boat. The guy's got a charter, and they screw around for five, ten minutes, got the line off of the rock, got the fish laid out on the surface, and everyone did the same thing. Oh, my God, fish is well over 50 inches. Really? Finally got his, he had a 30-pound boga grip, finally got the boga grip in its mouth, got the fish on board the boat, and they're all in a state of shot. They all wanted to kill it, but they all knew they couldn't because everybody in the world saw the fish. Right, right, right. So they nursed him for 30 or 40 minutes to get him back swimming strong enough to where they could release him. They released the fish. He's got him stand. The greatest thing is um, the head guy over at, in Tampa that runs um, the, the research center. You know his name? No. I've heard people refer Paul to Johnson, him before. Paul Johnson, is it? I'm not Paul positive. Johnson, whatever. He's a head guy. He's a snook dude. Yeah, he's a head guy with the marine industry. Right. Well, the best thing we had was the kid is standing next to a red bone rod. And you can see every guide and every measurement on <laughs> On that rod. So he's holding the fish up. So we've got the exact length of this fish, right. which was like 58 inches. And you're able to come up with an exact girth and width. And Paul, I think it's Paul Johnson. He called me and says, how big is that fish? I said, without a doubt, he's 55 plus. You really believe that? I said, I'll stake my reputation on it. That fish is 55 if he's an ounce. He's fat to the tail. He have pictures of Tail is tail's twelve inches or eighteen inches around. The girth is X. Um, yeah, and there's and I'm sure I've got those pictures on my computer somewhere. Yes. Well, I don't. I, it's I'm glad you told the stories because, you know, I I knew I was going to piss some people off when I was like you know kind of giggling at a forty inch snook, but because you know it's people are pretty proud of their forty inch snooks, and I get that. But I was brought up because of you and the guys that you hung out with not even thinking that a snook was big unless it broke 30 pounds. And I always preached that. And then when the people would measure the snooks, especially the guys on the West Coast, right? you know, through social media, we would I'd kind of make fun of them. Like, you're measuring the thing? You know? I, I like, it. I only me you know, I measure, I measure, you know, reds or trouts or whatever, but never thought about measuring a snook. I got a great story about measuring a snook. <laughs> I show up on Camino Real Bridge 10, 12 years ago. First of the mullet run, the Silvers. Mike that works for me, who's a great snook fisherman, does it all the time. He said, they've caught them there last few nights. What time? Oh, the tide's early. So the start of the outgoing tide, 9, 10, 11, they're going to be there. They're going to bite. A ball of coming from the south, shooting through the bridge. I said, all right, fine, I'll show up tonight, which I hadn't done. I walked right up front, grabbed a brand-new seven-foot cast net. Didn't even have a cast net. Grabbed one of my graphite 10 and a half, 11 11-foot snook rods. A 4 0 reel with probably a 100 pound braid on it and a five, six foot leader and a hook. And I pull up, I'm driving El Camino, a, a um, Ford Expedition, and I look and I can't believe my eyes. There are 40 people on this bridge. <laughs> I'm in a state of shock. This is not my cup of tea. Right. I walk up on the bridge, I have my cast at my rod, and I go to the north side of the bridge. Because there were less people there, I threw the cast net, got three or four baits, and everybody attacked. I said, guys, those are my bait. Let me pick one first, then you can have the rest. Helping the other guys yeah. out. Very nice of you. So I pick up a bait. Now, I invented, and I can prove it years ago, the throat hook, or we call gut hooking, of a mullet on the bottoms, underneath the gills, by the two little peck fins. Okay. All right, and that was designed for one reason. I throw the bait out. Make him turn over, keep tension on it, make him go down, swim him back to the bridge. As he gets toward the shadow line, 
I release the tension. That mullet's coming up off of the bottom, and the stuck nails them. Right. And that's all the principle is. But that principle started on um, Lake Worth Pier with a greenie. You know, people people to this day are hooking their, their baits like that. Right. Do you think they even know why they're hooking their baits like that? Do they well, to even... make it go down. Well, you know, of but course. do you think they know? Hell no. <laughs> I think they just saw it. I just saw laugh. somebody else do it. Right. I just laugh. <laughs> and they don't bleed bad there, especially a greenie and a pilchard. Right. You, in the top of the nose, they do. So anyway... So I make the bait go down. The guy standing next to me is a big six foot five guy. who has got fancy rods and all bit. He's got a big old red troll right. They used to sell him one, two, three, four ounce. He's got a three or four ounce troll right on, on a gut hook mullet. Right. And he looks at me. He says, "You'll never catch a fish that way." And I look around behind me to see who he's talking to. <laughs> like, who, me? <laughs> so he's telling me. This is a cute story. So anyway, I said, oh, all right. Now I take a mullet, you've seen me cast, and do my round-the-world cast. Oh, yeah, I've seen it. Right? About 100,000 other people have seen it. So I can take that <laughs> cast and throw my mullet three times as far, with dead accuracy every time, throw the bait out twice as far as he did, tension on the spool, bringing him back to the bridge. But the third cast, thump. Fish ate it. I wind down to him, set the hook, and it's we're on. And I've got 18, 20-pound fish laid out on the surface. I point my rod down at him. I wind up tight. I flip him up, and I don't flip him to bounce. I flip him up, almost catch him in midair, put my thumb in his jaw, take the hook out, and let him go. All right. Not one word was said by me. <laughs> Not one. He's too big to keep. So I go to the other side of the bridge where my cast net's laying by the draw. Throw the net, get eight or ten mullet. I look on the north side of the bridge. There's 25 guys there. There were two of us. <laughs> I go to the south side of the bridge, stay to the right side, which was my favorite side anyway. Like ten foot off the pilots. Flip the bait out, two or three casts. Thump. I get eight again. Same procedure. I do it one more time. By now, I can't even fish either side of the bridge. So I finally ended up, I've already caught three fish. They were all too big to keep. One of them laid on the surface and come loose, and he was a full 25, 28 pounds because I didn't try to put, lift him up. And I go by the bridge center side, closer to that, I flip a bait out. Now, I have not been on this bridge for one hour. Maybe from the time I stepped on the bridge, I've caught and released three fish. Um, caught my own bait, didn't get him out of a live well. I might have been there 25 to 30 minutes. Throw the cast net, got a bait, left side. The bait, when they got out beyond the end of the south side, was getting sprayed or spooked, so I knew there was a lot of fish out there. Flipped it way out, one, two, three, whoop, thump, wind him up, got him coming, winched him almost across the surface when he jumped, got him to the bridge, flipped him up, grabbed him, about a jaw, laid him out. I got my rod laying right next to me. I lay him out right there on the bridge. Look at him. He's legal. Pick him up, took the hook out, start walking off the bridge. There's 15 guys following me. Nobody on the bridge has caught a fish. Nobody on the bridge. A few people yanked and snagged. They had bites, but they didn't catch them. All right. I get down to my cast net, roll up my cast net, walk to the end of the bridge where my truck is parked, pull the tailgate down. I open up the tailgate, put my rod in, but first I take my snook, lay it on the plastic, black plastic bag I'd already put there because I knew I was going to catch one. <laughs> in complete confidence. Total, never dreamed of. It's like <laughs> Tiger Woods said he wasn't going to win a tournament. He wouldn't go if he didn't think he'd win. That's right. I used to make a joke years ago, 50 years ago. I said, I'll bet you $100. That's back when 100 to me would be like 10000 today. On any given night, 365 days a year, I'll go catch a legal size snook. Bet you the $100 every night that you want to bet me. Because I guarantee I will. If I don't, I'll pay you. Right. But if I do, you're going to pay my ass. <laughs> so okay. I'm sitting there, and the big tall guy is standing next to me because he's bigger than everybody else. He says, you can't keep that fish. And I don't know what to say. <laughs> the young kids are all, you know, the, the young kids, they're not about the word to say anything to him or me. 
<laughs> and behind him is somebody else standing there. He says, you know who you're talking to? No. He says, that's Tom Green. Well, the, you mean the real Tom Green? He knew the name. He didn't know the face. No idea. Okay. He says, the real Tom Green? He says, yeah, that's Tom Green. And if he says it's legal, it's legal. Well, he didn't have a ruler. I've been watching him all night. He caught four fish all around me, and I still don't know what he was doing. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I says, you know what's funny? I didn't use your red troll, right? And I still caught him, right? <laughs> yeah, but how did you do that? And then he goes and makes another comment. He said, well, how, long, how big is that fish? And at that time, I guess the, the length was 34 inches. Right, for, for the for overslot. The, right, overslot. And I said, he's 33 and a half. He says, how do you know that? You didn't even look at him. You didn't measure him. I said, no, I'm smarter than all you bums. What is you're, that? You're like the Venezuelans, the guys that had so many shots right, that yeah. they actually know what the hell they're talking about. And my rod is laying on the back of the car. I say, see that piece of tape? Yeah. See that arrow? Yeah. I says, that arrow's on one side of the tape, right? Well, yeah. What does that mean? I said, if you take my fish, see a piece of tape down there? Yeah. And you run it up here, and you look at where's the arrow? It's about that far short. That's a half inch shorter than the nose of the fish. It means he's 33 and a half. Oh, that's a good idea. Who taught you that? <laughs> I think a boy's named Tom Green. <laughs> well, let me, let me, so that's when I, that's the first time I technically needed a measurement. Right, right. Well, you know, they... I mean, I remember when I first started catching the snooks, the big snooks like that, you know, down around the Los Angeles Bridges where I lived. You know, if he was big, you put a gaff in it and you take him home and mom was happy and we'd have a big dinner. And, you know, that was just kind of the way you did it. And if you caught a small one, you might let that one go. Right. But you'd kill those big son of a bitches. Now the, I, I mean, was <laughs> feeding seven kids, a mother and a father. My father was blind. We had a big refrigerator freezer freezer in the house and dad would stack them he'd roll them in saran wrap roll them in aluminum foil and lay them on a shelf the small ones on the bottom shelf the big medium large four shelves of fish just by the size and the weight as to which shelf they went on so if we got a party for four people six people seven people eight people that's the one he took off of that shelf let me ask you a question you know um me growing up in the you know early '80s, I had you to look up to as a snook guru. Right. Um, yeah, we had Copeland to look up. I didn't know Copeland as well as I knew you. I knew him a little bit because of you. But see, I was doing it ten, a full ten years before George even started. Is that right? He didn't know. But my question was: Was there a guy for you that was your Tom Green? No. There was nobody you there. See, that for was you. a problem. What I had was I was on Pamela Park Bridge. Okay. I got up on the Pamela Park Bridge on the outgoing tide. There was a guy that owned the lawn service, another guy that owned the Fever McGee that did this, and another guy. And all they were throwing back then, and I was very young. I was started at 11. Right. They were throwing a, a Nylure 105 white feather with 18 to 24 inches of seven-strand 27 or 45-pound leader wire. That was their leader. And they crimped it. <laughs> They'd throw it upstream, let it go to the bottom, and bounce it back and hook the fish on the bottom. The snook were feeding into the current on the bottom. I'm on top of the bridge. Well, the big snook I could see on the shadow line, the mullet would come through. I could see him eat them. Right. It didn't take too long to figure out that you want to catch that big one because they're catching the 24, 28, 18 inches every night. There's an article I read the other day by accident, and I thought Steve Ward has wrote it, but the first 15 snook I ever caught in my life, I had to let 14 of them go because the limit was 18 inches, and every fish was 17, 17 and a half inches. Huh. And I finally caught one big enough to keep. I went home with that one fish. Well, from there, I learned to catch bigger ones. I got you. So you didn't have the mentor. You didn't have the guy no. to look up to. No. That's... Uh... Maybe that's why you're, that you've been so successful over the years is like you had to. Learn but what? It but what I did have it. was, I had a boy when I wrote my book. I dedicated to three people. Okay, George Copeland. Okay. Scott Hitch, and a boy named Don Kaler. Okay. All right, Don Kaler. All these kids were younger than me at the time, and Don Kaler, 
in 19, let's say, we both graduated high school. I graduated in 67. Don was 8, 9, 10 years younger than me, but he was real smart. And I told him from the beginning, I want you to take a one of these notebooks that we had back then, school notebook. He wrote down information. Where do we catch the fish? What did we catch it on? What was the tide? What was the moon? What was the wind? What was the bait? What time of year and when? How big was he? And he had all those books that he kept for 35 years. So he was like a document freak. He made a document freak. Okay. The only difference was I had the same book, <laughs> but mine was in my head. Right. I never needed it. So my memory, my accountant tells me today, he's got 100 accounts. And he says, out of 100 accounts, nobody can quote to him a situation. You wrote a check back then for this. What's it for? Well, we did this. We transferred money. All that stuff I still remember. I can't remember your name. But you remember the right. details. I remember the color of your fishing rods. I, wanna, I, don't, I don't know if you know this, Tom, but um, I sell a shirt online from my website that says, In Hog Leg We Trust. Right. And we nicknamed a big mullet the Hog Leg. Right. And um, it was you that taught me about using a big mullet way back, way back. Right. Like, Very short, fast story. Morton Inlet, standing <laughs> there with, I believe, George Copeland, fishing on the North Jetty. No bait coming through. Four o'clock in the morning, we got big nets in a white sand beach there. We're trying to get a big, a decent bait. I had thrown the net, and I caught a big old yellow eye silver. And when I say a big yellow eye, a big yellow eye silver is a two and a half pound bait, and you know what That's I mean. That's a certified hog leg. That's a hog leg. <laughs> All right, big yellow eyes, and we catch them every year in May and June when tuna season starts in Cat Key, because we can sell that bait for five, six, seven dollars. We debone split tail for the tuna fishermen. God, I remember those days. All right. And that, that's what that is. Okay. So, and that bait, no fish in the world can eat it. So, I've only got one bait. I'm going to put the bait in the water. In the water. So, I take my same rod with a four inch lead, a four foot leader, an eight ounce sinker. Tide's going out. So, I don't throw it in the, all the way out into the current, but right on the edge of that white sandbar, standing on the north jetty, even with the south jetty. And I'm waiting and looking, and there's 10 people going up and down looking for mullet. All of a sudden, here comes a pot of six or eight popcorn silvers. I call them popcorn silver. Right. That's about a, a goggle eye size, seven, eight, nine inch bait. Yeah, eight inch, right? Yeah, popcorn silver. Put your hand around them, hold them tight. I get seven or eight baits. So I got baits for all my guys in the big net. Run over, throw my net down. Reach over, grab my rod. It's a four o. Lay it on the on the pipe or the the railing cable, and I'm winding as fast as I can wind to get that bait to me. As fast as I wind that bait, and I get it halfway in, all of a sudden the rod bends double, going the other way, screaming, <laughs> just like a barracuda or a big tarpon ate it. Okay. Just about that time. Here's a 39 and a half pound snook with that mullet in its mouth, already eating it, all right, and had to eat it at that speed with the hook hooked in the corner of the mouth. And that snook proved to me that I've caught big snook on little baits before, but that snook right there ate that mullet with me winding it full speed. You know, I don't, you, you probably don't remember, but I'm trying to figure out the snook game. I'm a, I mean, dude. I'm 12 years old, and I'm running around the bridges, and my dad has me down here one day, and um, I'm in your ear about bait. Right. And you guys are rigging split tails. Right. So you pick up about, I don't know, 14-inch big bait, you right. know, and you guys are rigging them up, and you throw that in front of me, and you said, Jeff, he goes, anything worthwhile to catch, this is what you can fish with. Right. And it was about a, you know, 14, 15-inch mullet. Big yellow eye. And, um... To this day, Tommy, to this day, I've put thousands of anglers on huge fish right. using the old hog leg. Right. I got taught that by you. A big bait, big fish. Yeah, but the hog leg and the mullet that's, I mean, marlin, right. snooks, yep. tarpon, yep. you name it. All my trophies, all the clients that I put on trophies, the vast, vast majority of them 
or with the hog leg. I'm and so you I... taught that to me, and I am using it to its fullest my whole fishing career and even to today. All right, we're sitting in this office. Behind me on the wall is a picture of a 50-pound snook. All right? <laughs> 50 pounds, people. Yeah, not 50-inch, all right? And tell you how big he was. You, it's 19... 65 to 75, they made a very, very large white ice chest. You know, long before Low Boys, long before it was a commercial ice chest. Okay. That fish was so big when he laid in the bottom of that ice chest, his head came out one end and his tail came up the other end. To this day, I'd pay a lot of money to get the measurement of that. That's how big that snook was. That's and I got picture of him in my office and around the store. But that fish was so big. When we cut his head off, a bunch of the kids were running around the taco store with the head of that fish over the head, their head on their shoulders because the head was <laughs> you so look gigantic. At it, that's how big the head is. That's cool. And you can put do a picture and send that out to him. But I was on Flagler Bridge, throat hook mullet, same deal, no bait around, a few blacks, and I caught one of the biggest yellow eye blacks. Actually, it was I think it was a black. I still say. It weighed about three and a half pounds. It was all you could do to sling it. You couldn't throw it. And that that snook ate that black mullet on the north side of Flagler Bridge in the corner. And he tore, he fought like a, I thought it was a Jew fish the whole fight till he broke the surface. Yeah, but, monsters. And that's what it was. Yeah, monsters. Big baits eat big fish. I'm so glad that I came down here to do this because I was starting to feel bad about making fun of the 40-inch snook club. Well, here's the deal. And I'll, I'll blame you on it. So if you don't hear me, want to hear me again? All he's got to do is show up. We can do one of these a month, just like this, because I've got over 150 stories just like this. You know, maybe we will do one of these. Um, you know, one of the things about the the way we do our podcast recording is maybe one out of five, I come down and have a guest like yourself, and then I have. Like my crew, you know, you have your crew right. here. Okay, okay. You got your rod guy, you got your bait guy, you got the young guy that just started. I have a crew like that, right? And they're all characters in the podcast. They've been characters in uh, the YouTube um, that we've done over the years. But um, man, I'd love to come down every once in a while and get some stories from you, and talk about um, you know the basic roots and you know. It's not an accident. You know, I tell the story all the time. 10% of the fish would catch 90% of the fish. It's really 5% catch 95%. Well, you know, people over the years, they want to know, you know, how, how I've gotten where I am in my fishing career. And I've always told them that I've had an unfair advantage. And after this recording, if they don't get it, I mean, the guys that I was able to, I mean, before I could even shave, I'm hanging out with my dad who introduced me to guys like yourself and... It was just part of life. It wasn't like, you know. That's, that was life. Well, and then me, I mean, you know, that that's from when I can first remember. That's what I remember, Tommy. Yeah. And here I am, 51 years old, and um, still in the fishing game. And then to come down here and to do a recording like this with you just makes it, me feel like a million bucks. It makes it bucks. all worthwhile. It does. It also makes me feel better for making fun of the 40-inch snook club because I'm going to start a new club starting today. The 30-pound snook club. Good. And if they catch a 30-pound snook, they have to measure it both ways, width and girth. They have to get the good picture. They'll send it to me. I'll anoint them into the club. But before I anoint them into the club, I'm going to show you the fish. All right. Well, you know, there's a very good statement there. The um, IGFA called me 8, 10, 15, 20 years ago and said, would you sponsor a 30-pound snook club? I said, sure. As long as it's 30 pounds, I'll be glad to sign off. Because I used to give away the, um, the – Dave McCode did the artwork okay. on a release trophy certificate, and it did say 30-pound snook club. Well, we're going to make a certificate. All right. There's going to be two people that can sign that certificate. I might even have it. Listen, uh, two people are going to be able to sign right. that certificate. Me – And you. And you. All right. I'm and all they, for it. And they are not a certified member of the club unless we both sign it. Listen, this won't be the last uh, recording we've done. Please don't, because it'll be <laughs> very worthwhile for both of us. This is not going to be the last time where we're going to do a recording with Tommy. As a matter of fact, I want to do one with him and his buddy, Steve Waters. Right. Uh, I love Steve. Right. Uh, I can remember him forever. I'd love to sit down with you two guys. Um, 
And uh, all right, the public, you, the public, have always got questions. All right, and I write articles for all the magazines and have done it forever. And one thing I started doing years ago is, if you got a question, send it in. Send it to Luck or Dog. Send it whatever. Send it to we, Jeff at LuckerDog.com. We, we want to know how many people are listening. How many people want to learn something? How many people are willing to listen? And if you don't want to listen, don't bother asking. Period. That's your loss. Hey, uh, but you know, there's some people that should be talking a lot, and then there's certain people that should be listening a lot. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. Thanks for tuning in to the Real Guy Podcast, Tommy. Thanks so much for doing it with me. Is I appreciate it, it very much, and proud to be here. Always a pleasure. And guys. When I tell you about real guys helping real guys, Tom Green, by far, head over heels, and he should be in the IGFA world of fame because of it. I'll it's be there one day, they say. It's Here, helped I more, got, I got another, more uh, anglers than anybody I know. I got another offer for you. Go ahead. I'll give you 10 signed books today. You get 10 people that listen to your podcast, that call you or however you want to set it up, All and right. give them a free book. All right, make sure you guys understand. Okay, a net full of tales is Tommy's book. Tommy's going to give me some signed copies. If you listen to this podcast and enjoyed it and would like a copy of Tommy's latest book, you email me, jeff at lunkerdog.com, and you will get a signed copy of the book. That's very gracious of you, Tommy. For free. For free. Thanks so much, and thanks for being on The Real Guy Podcast.